I think I first heard you here in shit, 90s with Bobcas. I think you were here with Bobcas, right? Oh, wow. wow. So, and then with Sex Mob, obviously, many times. And um, so, but yeah, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Uh, oh, thanks for uh, having me. You know, I'm exploring all the musicians you, you play basically with already. So I was like, man, shit have so many albums of you so it would be nice to chat a little and so um but uh i'll just jump in with uh some of the stuff you've done in like you know this last period of course there's been the COVID period which i don't even <laughs> want to dig into too much but uh i want to ask you about this record you did the art of the saxophone and uh your solo saxophone playing i think it's you know it's it's a special thing especially in the saxophone world i think you've created your own sound you know with the towel mute and this all the extended techniques and everything like how did you start playing solo saxophone when did that begin actually um i think um the first time i played a solo set was when i had my first residency at the stone and zorn said i should play a suggested i play a solo set as being the ultimate challenge um that's the words he used but um <laughs> i i did it and i i kind of i kind of didn't like it and um mm. and because you are just really you it's 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 very you know you're very on naked, I guess you could say. Yeah. So I, I, I tried solo um, a few more times with various kinds of ways to fill in the fill in the space. Um, so like um, lap, I, I was doing a lot of sound art and electronic music at yeah. one point. So I was kind of trying to bring that in just to something to kind of kind of cushion those those silent spots. Um, but then I found that to be not really satisfying either. And, 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 um, and didn't do it for years. And then I, then I did it again. And, um, I, I found that I, I, I really, by that time, I really, I really loved it. Um, and it's, it's simply a matter of that. <clears throat> I've, I've I've always been interested in kind of deconstructing the saxophone and kind yeah. of like getting away from the normal sounds, the normal roles that the instrument plays. Um, not out of ideology, but just that's what I'm interested in. Um, but um, if you you approach it from the point of view that you're once a piece starts, that you're simply just responsible for everything that happens in it. Um, it's kind of freeing in that way. Um, Sometimes you'll hear somebody play like solo, but you can tell in their head, there's still a band playing with them. Yeah. They're just playing, you know, yeah. but um, I, I came to really enjoy it. And I, I did it um, a couple of times at, um, at Saalfelden Festival in, in Austria. And, um, and those were really uh, fantastic experiences. And um, um, so when, when I play solo, I, I would just play like just a really long, basically really long pieces. Yeah. Um, and I did um, my first recordings were actually, um, do you know a guy named Skerrick? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So Skerrick, uh, I used to live in Seattle and Skerrick and I go way, way back. And he, oh, okay. uh, he came, he approached me once um, after a gig and he said that he really wanted to make a, a solo saxophone record um of me playing to to document kind of what what i do and stuff and i was like oh really 
at that point I hadn't really, maybe that was after the, after those first couple of times that weren't so great, maybe that was the first time I'm I'm sure it was that I, I tried doing it again. And, um, and like the next time I was visiting Seattle, we went to, uh, we did some recording in his studio. And then we also did some recording in, uh, this really giant, long pedestrian tunnel. Ah, um, that's the tunnel Seattle. recordings. That's the, okay, okay. That's the tunnel recordings. Oh, and, um, of course, the Seattle area has a long history of, of, uh, recording in big reverby places with the, um, the cistern up in Port Orchard, um, with, um, Pauline Arloveros and Stuart Dempster and those guys. And, but anyway, um, that was really fun. And so I think that's what, that's what got me kind of back into it. But anyway, fast forward to, um, I, I always called those records kind of the art of the saxophone mm-hmm. just because they're, they're, to me, they're just kind of like, they're the, the, fo- the, the focus of what I do on the instrument. So I just kind of call them that and then subtitle whatever the situation is. The last one um, was done at the recording studio called the Leaf Lounge. Um, I think that's pronounced L-E-T-H-E. Um, and that was way more um, kind of clinical um in in approach rather than having really really long improvisations yeah. they were really short and kind of focused and and on the record they're kind of labeled kind of like what the overall kind of like theme was it didn't really i didn't start out with that in in mind but i was in the studio alone i just engineered it myself um and uh the studio owner was um was out of out of town i think so i really i just had i was in there all by myself and just kind of really (laughs) taking my time and doing stuff and it kind of it kind of started it kind of turned into this thing where i was i was doing really short focus pieces and so that's what it that's what it turned out being Mm. so i mean when you begin a solo concert now like how do you envision it do do you have like a preconception where you don't want to go or you just basically start improvising or do you have an idea how to build it I don't have any idea how to how to build it. The I just kind of um, the the trick is to feel relaxed before playing, you know, um, because then you can pay attention and and take your time. So that's that's the only plan I have is to try to do that. Yeah, yeah because you, you know, because solo, you know, piano, it's different and guitar obviously you know all all the harmonic instruments but like you know i talked to peter evans or some trombone players that's like you said it's naked saxophone it's even scarier i think it's i don't know or not like kind of the same level like this fear factor you have that or not not really not not at all it's it's really it's just it's an opportunity to just to treat the instrument as a as a um a tool to make sound yeah, it's okay. it's it's no longer i'm playing a melody instrument i'm playing you know something that's in a that's in you know tuning um it's it's really just it's a it's a sound maker you know mm. and that's so that's and a, and a solo concert is just a, a um an opportunity to really to really explore what what can happen because you can't you can't practice that Oh, you, yeah. I mean, I've for the first time I played at Salt Feldon, I I practiced all summer, like. But you just can't replicate like performing right. in front of people, and I, I really miss it playing yeah. solo. I'd like to do it again. Oh yeah, yeah. I would love to see to hear you. I mean, I haven't heard your life yet solo. It's, uh, yeah. I th- I think it must be special, you know, like. I, I've, it's special for me. I I hope that uh, I hope I hope it's special for people that. <laughs> um are there when you started to explore this solo saxophone playing did you did you check out like the pat the you know like liebman or steve lacy or those guys like what they did or you didn't uh, dig into that area um not really i didn't do any research the kind of like you know point yeah. focused research in that area but um um and i kind of didn't want to because i i I've I've heard and you know of course you know just in you know, I've heard a, a lot of solo saxophone records but I, I didn't want to go that way because I I didn't want to um, 
a have have something to compare what I do to some sort of standard yeah. and also just kind of like be drawn to how I imagine maybe somebody else thinks about it. You know, I really kind of, you know, wanted to to try to grow my own roots, so to speak. In it. So I, I didn't really, really uh, study it, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, when, when I hear you playing, like, you, you've created one of the most unique sounds, I think, on the alto sax. And uh, when I hear, you know, wh wh whatever lineup, I mean, I want to talk about your records as a leader, but you know, also as a sideman or a sax mop or whatever, it's like really this recognizable sound, which is hard to achieve. And uh, how did you, as a teenager, I guess, in Seattle, you mentioned Seattle, mm -hmm. what, what, what was the story there? I know you, you and Jim Black and all, all these guys, you know, Brad Shepik, I guess, go way, way, way back, but uh, yeah. You remember those first steps into jazz, like, or how did that happen? I yeah, well, yeah, of course. Um, going way back, my my father was a musician, and oh, really? um, in fact, the, the the saxophone I played, the one I've played uh, my whole life, was his. Um, oh, my earliest childhood memory uh, is of him walking around the apartment pra practicing. Oh wow! Um, I remember one time. I was, must have been tiny because he was very short. Um, going up and kind of pulling down the the horn and looking inside, and he played like a loud note or a low note or something, and I ran off home laughing. So I remember that. <laughs> but um, but he played records constantly. Um, so I was just kind. Of, it was just always in the house, just always around. Undoubtedly, a huge, you know, just kind of like, um, you know, you're just marinated in in music, um, and. And of course, when I when I got to um, Seattle, I I, <clears throat> I I lived through. I started playing saxophone in junior high school, and then in high school, and it was kind of in a in a bit of a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I got to Seattle, I met all these great musicians, like you say, like Brad Shepard, Jim Black, and Aaron Alexander, Arnold Hammerschlag, mm -hmm. um, just. Um, Jay Grinelli, Mike Serene, oh, yeah. um, then, you know, actually Jim, I didn't meet until I'd been there for a few years. because all those guys went to East coast schools, Kung Vu and Chris Speed oh, and yeah. Jim. Um, but I gradually, gradually, um, came to know them and, and, um, but, um, um, yeah, just, it was, it was, I went to Cornish college of the arts, which was in, at that time, it was a really amazing time to be in Seattle. Um, from around 1988 to 1994. Um, and it was also really cool to be in a school that was um, small enough to not be one of those kind of machine schools where it's yeah, like, you kind of, you enter this, you know, I was really, it was really, um, I, I pursued all kinds of different things. And, um, and I have to say, if, if there's anything, um, about my saxophone playing related to pedagogy. It's um, hmm. um, my teacher, the, the, the great, late, late great Hadley Callan, um, who um, really went to, uh, went to great lengths to, to uh, kind of pound me into shape. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, it was, um, it was difficult. Um, but I, because if I digress, like I had, I was mostly self-taught until I got to college. And by the time oh, I got into okay. college, I, I was, I was playing with a lot of pressure in my throat and I'd actually was injuring like the back of my, my throat, like the way I was playing, mm -hmm. you know, when air leaks out through your nose, if you're like, yeah. you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, so when I got to, when I got to college, I was like, I couldn't play for more than five or 10 minutes without having to stop and rest for like five minutes. Um, but, you know, cause I had horrible, this was all wrong. And, and, um, you know, I was, you know, I played, uh, my audition was like giant steps and monk tunes and, and Mingus <laughs> tunes. And, and, and I was, I was playing, um, uh, I thought I knew a lot. Um, but, you know, with, with Hadley, I had to relearn how to play the saxophone from the beginning with um, what's called a double lip embouchure. Um, 
I was in a practice room, like playing major scales, like da da da, to try to undo all those years of bad habits. And um, it would have been a lot easier for Hadley to just say, like, "Oh, you're doing great. You'll figure it out. You're sounding great. Uh, see you next week." But he was just like, you know. And of course, I was, I was. It was difficult for me, just my ego and whatever, to like have to do I'm that. Sure. But yeah. he, he really was like, uh, pretty um pretty um pretty brutal with me but also loving and um i i miss him but um i go owe a great debt to hadley callan wherever wherever mm. is. and um and my my father just passed away in august so i owe a big debt to him maybe they're yeah. hanging out yeah. having coffee and, yeah probably <laughs> right now which would be nice but anyway um so yeah so seattle saxophone had the calman um and then i moved to new york in 94 and, and a lot of other stuff happened so how did you base that decision and was was it easy because the entire creative seattle scene almost went to the east coast like but did you go together or was that an easy question having those guys there so i always um i always knew that um uh once i once i figured out that um I was going to have to try to do a life in music that I would wind up being a jazz musician. You have to go to New York at some point, you know, um, or at least that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, and I was really lucky in two ways. One was that, um, since I was kind of on the young end of this, this crowd of Seattle musicians, um, a lot of people were, had already been here for a year or two. Or more before I moved out, so that was one way I was really lucky. And um, like for example, I the the first nine months or so I lived in New York, I I, I basically stayed on the couch of Brad Shepik and Mike Serene <laughs> okay. in Brooklyn. Um, the other way I was really lucky is that I had already um, been playing with um, Wayne Horvitz in his band Pigpen. Yeah, I wanted to and, ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, Pigpen. That I love the band, me. man. Woo. Miss Miss that Anne, really, that record. That's oh, thanks. Cool, Shit, yeah, love that's it. um, yeah, that's um, Pigpen. We gotta talk about Pigpen, but um, um, so but through Wayne and I'd met Frizzell, who who'd already both of those guys had moved out to Seattle at the same time, and um, gradually I met I met Stephen Bernstein was in town playing with the Karamazovs, and I and I met mm. him, and so when I got to New York, I'd already kind of was you know I already knew. And I was familiar with the, you know, kind of the downtown scene and had met some people like who had come through Seattle already. So I, I already kind of, I got there and kind of had my bearings a little bit, um, which was, uh, um, I was very lucky to, to have that. Yeah. But um, Pigpen was a band I tried to quit um, a couple of times. <laughs> Why? Uh, because <laughs> when, when it started, um, Wayne was, Wayne was still, I think when it started, I mean, Wayne was still playing with, with Naked City occasionally. Mm. Um, and, um, we were playing mostly Wayne's music. We did a, a few Naked City pieces, but we were yeah. playing Wayne's music, but it was super loud, super loud. And, um, I was hearing, uh, I was hearing electric guitar. I was not hearing, um, um, uh, like saxophone and mm. i could scream and i could squeal but i couldn't do what zorn does that's 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 a that's a, another whole other you know thing completely unique to him and and i i i just couldn't figure out how to play in that band interesting um and it was really okay. frustrating um because uh, there's unbelievably loud and i'm i'm sitting there with this little little pipe with a with a piece of reed at the end of it and trying to compete and trying to blend and i just couldn't figure it out but but and i told wayne i was like man i, don't, I really don't i really don't think i but i a couple of times but he said he wouldn't let me he was like i think you'll i think you'll just hang in there i think you'll figure it out i think you'll figure it out and that was a major influence on my playing was 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 having to figure out how to how to fit into a really fuzzy, really distorted, really mm. loud kind of situation. Um, how to, how to, how to work in there. And, and, um, and, um, and I did, and it's, it really, it changed my, it changed my life. 
I mean, Wayne was, um, he's changed yeah. my life a lot of ways, but just being in that band really changed my music. Yeah, it's like, I love that group, you know, it's, I mean, I love Wayne's playing and composing and everything, and but that 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 period of his big fan, it's it's like really this, yeah. Well, like you said, like this Zornish kind of vibe that he was exploring, maybe. But it's it's not Zornish. It's you know yeah. what I mean, like kind of. Yeah, we were doing. It was kind of like um, we were also doing some some songs from um, his band, The President. Yeah. Um, so there was that kind of like influence there. It was always like Wayne's music. And then we, we, he had some naked city charts and those were really fun to, to play. And, um, um, and it's interesting the way the band kind of evolved over the years, like it, it, um, as his, his interests kind of changed. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I really, I, I, I miss that band. Um, Fred, uh, Fred Shell, the bass player, Fred Shell and uh, passed away uh, several years ago. And that was, um, I'll always miss miss Fred because he was he was really great. You know? Yeah, yeah, I love that band too. I mean, well, well, you, you mentioned that you, you own a lot to Wayne. Did, did Wayne encourage you? Like, I know you did like Good Kitty and Three Hundred. They're kind of in the same. You're kind of starting out as a band leader. Also, did Wayne encourage you to also to become a band leader, or how did your story of band leading begin? Actually, um, I think it was just something um, I wanted to do. Mm. And um, I had a a few things. I, I had kind of experience. Um, Babkiss was kind of a co-led yeah. band. We all we would all bring in music. I wouldn't bring in too much music, um, but um, certainly Brad wrote a lot, and Aaron Aaron wrote a lot, and yeah. um, and I just kind of like um, wanted to put some things together. And then I had a chance to make my first Knitting Factory record and I was playing with, with Chris Speed and Mike Serene and I was like, well, let's, let's make this a band. And um, yeah, so, and then 300 was was natural. That was the record that was after that, just yeah. playing, you know, getting getting back with Wayne and um, Kenny Wallace and, and um, playing mostly improvised music. But, um, but yeah, and I, I still play with Wayne, you know. Yeah. You, you you like the role of, of being a kind of I mean I mean it's you are the band leader there although it's improvised music so it's kind of collective vibe almost going on but still yeah in in three hundred there were there were some pieces pieces yeah um, and um, Wayne I think we did a couple of Wayne's things as well but um, that was the last record I did kind of as a normal band leader the the mm -hmm. one i did after that is a is called descending to end and that that was a just all sound art record just all solo i spent like um many months just kind of like evenings in in uh at jamie saff's studio just kind of piecing together collaging this this record um and then after that i've, I've did solo records and sound art records and I, I haven't done a record that was like a a band band in a, in a really long time and i kind of have um i don't really know how i feel about writing music anymore i've i've written a few things that were like mostly through composed for like large ensembles and that was really interesting and mm. educational but um <laughs> okay. it could never rehearse them enough and they get performed twice and then it's over mm, um yeah. and I couldn't get money to record them. So, but that's, I kind of feel like if I want to write music, I kind of want to write through composed music or just improvise, improvise. Yeah. the, the, that middle ground. Um, and you hear this so often, it's just kind of like, you know, you, the band plays an in head and then that's like, um, the in head is like, um, like a dish that um just gets when it's once it's once it's empty once you played it it just gets pushed aside and then you're on to like the blowing and it, it's like yeah. and then at the end you go back and somebody's refilled the dish and you finish it like i i, I kind of was like not interested in doing heads that just kind of disappeared and then you have then you have then you have the good stuff you know um so i i just kind of want to just improvise with people i'm just that's what i'm interested in mm. you know so, so P Pollinator is also, I mean, it's kind of your band, the, the last 
grew, but right? Yeah. Well, gosh, you saw that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I love that, too, especially because, you know, I'm a guitarist, so I, I didn't know you play guitar. So I want to ask you also about that. I was oh my quite God. surprised, to be honest. I didn't know anybody saw that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Well, thanks for thanks for being so great. I saw that. Um, that was um, yeah, like maybe eleven years ago or twelve years ago. I I I I owned a guitar all that you know since forever, like everybody. And then um, I just thought, like one day, like, well, what would happen if I if I actually tried to learn how to play it? Um, saxophone. My saxophone is playing is influenced by tenor players and yeah. with a few alto players and then electric guitar like that's that's what informs myself so it's like i thought like what would happen if i actually played learn how to play a guitar and i got obsessed with it pretty quickly and um because it's in in every way the opposite right of a, of yeah. a, of a wind instrument sure. um in every way and I could talk about this for hours. So your, your your hard drive will cry, Uncle. No, no, but yeah, let's come on. That. Let's dig into it a little bit. Go. You know, it's like obviously it's like more than one note at once. Sure. It's you 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 hit a note and it rings, and and you know you, you don't have you know it's not breath breathing. There yeah. isn't that. Yeah. Um, hitting harder does not necessarily make it louder or better. <laughs> you know, it's but um, <laughs> it's also just a spatial thing that visually yeah like um you know a saxophone is just a tube with the mouthpiece up here so the longer you make the tube the lower the pitch is you make the tube loud longer by closing holes right so in the left hand is this is like you know b a g that's descending from pinky middle you know that's descending going that way but on guitar that's yeah. ascending that's ascending. so it's like everything about it is completely upside down after I got obsessed with it and after a few months of just kind of like only doing that, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to grow up and, and be an adult again and, and get back to the saxophone. Otherwise that's going to, that's going to suffer. But I found actually that when I got back to the saxophone, my saxophone playing was changing. It had really changed my saxophone playing, which in my book changes good. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it changes fantastic. It, it, it changes good. So I was like, holy cow, this is really really interesting um what, I've had what other sense did experiences change? hard to describe but like oh. um um you can you can learn how to do something you know it's just like you know saxophone and that kind of like you know thing in my brain is just like a very worn pathway you know from a lifetime of doing it but if you do something something else in a similar similar milieu that's like you're just you're just you're adding new pathways, you're adding new ways to, you know, for your mind to work. And it just, it just changed everything on top of just, you know, um, you know, actively playing music in a different part of the band, like trying to play, you yeah. know, um, a, 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 some friends, um, Laura Cromwell and, um, um, and her husband, um, um, John Medham, who plays everything, but he played, he played bass. We started a little, band called the micro titans and that's kind of where i figured a lot of stuff out and it's just like it was just amazing to play differently and it's still to this day it's really it's been really fascinating the way that um guitar actually made me a lot better saxophone player so i've 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 become an evangelist as i say of, of um getting a, my adult musician friends to like if you play something with your hands do something with your breath and vice versa it doesn't matter how far you get into yeah. it but um, it'll change what you do, and and for the better. It'll be it'll be it'll be amazing. I guarantee it. So oh, yeah. 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 So I played guitar, um, and um, started to write music for guitar and um, play with other people, and and then um, during how was the that, lockdown, how was that in the beginning? <laughs> playing, with, playing with other people i mean you know it must have been like uh, let's say on that you know on that youtube it's like sarah and tony is like amazing musicians which you oh and... they're friends that was that's that's fine that's I'm easy oh, okay but like okay. That, that's fine that i'm over that um 
what was worse was Frizzell was sitting like right there. Is that, oh, man. That, that was that was what was a bit worse. Um, but um, but he's a friend too, so it's just like oh um, oh whatever whatever I'll just you know. um, um, the first gigs. This was another interesting thing. Was like I've I've already played like professionally for many 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 years. Like it's um, but playing my first gigs on guitar in like a dive dive bar and with like five other bands on the night and nobody there and like i'd be so nervous i'd almost literally be throwing up and i'm just kind of oh, like yeah. I'm, I'm i'm observing myself experiencing this just going like what is this wow this is really you know um and you know i'm it's not like um i'm still you know not um in a lot of ways i, I don't feel like a guitarist in the sense that i can you know, I can do kind of what I do on guitar, but I can't, you know, if you want me, if you want me to do X, Y, Z, it's like, I'm, I don't know, I'll try, but you know, <laughs> anyway, um, during the lockdown, I didn't, I didn't touch the saxophone for the whole, uh, two years of that. Oh, wow. Um, and just play, I just practice guitar. Wow. Um, and, um, so it's been interesting just to finish this long, digression it's been interesting now since um been playing saxophone again to kind of come back to the saxophone after a couple of years of just guitar and that's been that's been really really interesting too so yeah so the the pollinator gig was um pollinator was a duo project that um um valerie um mm -hmm. trujillo uh and i did just an, an online streaming performance as she did visual art and I did music and that was kind of pollinator. And then um, at the end of the pandemic or you know, it's not really over yet, but um, yeah. there was, there were, um, there were a number of, of small grants that, that were being given out by, I think it was New York state. Um, just kind of almost by, I think it was lottery actually it was by lottery. So I got one of these grants. So I was like, okay, I'll hire, I'll hire some friends. Uh, we'll play this music. And I'll hire a venue, which was this place, the Soapbox Gallery, which is a mm -hmm. great place. Um, and um, yeah, and that's, so, that, so that's how that, that happened. So yeah, I guess in that way, I was a, a band leader again um, <laughs> after a long time. But yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But uh, so, Shita, I, I want to go back to this guitar, <laughs> guitar uh, thing. I, I'm really cu curious. So, so w when you started learning this, did you like... You know, you know, what did you check? Like, who did you check? Especially, like, did you go to the rock guys and the jazz guys, or like just learning the basic, the scales, the voicings, the whatever? Yeah, um, I mean, I've of course I've I've heard a few guitar players in my life, and I've seen a few guitar players, and um, and I did start bugging my friends, um, but um, just like I was, you know looking at videos on youtube and like downloading like so cool. chord charts and then like um trying to just figure out well where to start and what's what's funny is that um that's another part of like you know being a you know a professional musician but then being a beginner again on some instrument where it's you're completely unfamiliar with like you know what there's a there's there's eight e's on this thing and i don't even know where one of them exactly. is you know yeah. like what is the frets and like you know it was really, and it still is. It's um, I'm a very dyslexic person, so it's like um, the visualization thing is something that um, is kind of not. It's getting better, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was just uh, and buying books. God, I've got so many, you know, guitar books, and that's amazing. And um, you know, just I just trying to piece it together. But unfortunately, I haven't had, you know, the experience that that most guitar players do of like being in garage bands when you're 14 or 15 and, and, you know, kind of learning all of that music. Um, I never, I never got to do that. that helps, so yeah. I feel like yeah. there's, there's, um, there's some, some, some weird gaps and like, I've, like I joined the, joined the, the, the marathon in a different part than most people that I start, you know, I just kind of hopped in over here and I don't know, limping along. On the 29th uh, kilometer, you're like, okay, I'll do the last yeah, exactly. 13. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, it's and, funny um, to, to look at you because you have this child's excitement when you talk about the guitar. I, I don't know. I feel kind of this when you talk now. Like, Oh, well, I, yeah, I, I am. 
I am excited about it and I, I do love it. And um, I'm getting to do it more and more. I've done it. Um, 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 like it's at, at Saulfeld and, and um, played um, some records and the new, the new sex mob record. I'm playing some guitar on it. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Um, okay. And um, yeah, I just, I just really, I, I, just, I just love it. Uh, maybe just ever since I was a kid, I, I really would have rather been a guitar player, but my, my very strict jazz father would not, oh, would not have allowed that. I don't think, but um, yeah, it's, it's, um, I understand it's a popular instrument. So, sure. you know. No, it's quite cool. I, I love that. It's, I think it's, it's an amazing, amazing story. And, that and respect actually that you you know you decided to do that i think that's that's a that's a cool thing to do actually you know yeah it's um yeah i it, i i never really i didn't i didn't know how far it would go it's just kind of like well as long as this is interesting i'll i'll continue doing it and that's that's kind of the 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 lesson of being and being an artist that yeah. I learned from like, you know, watch when I was a little kid and like, like watching movies about like Miles Davis and just seeing how like his music changed over and over and over again. It's because he was interested in doing different things. Mm -hmm. And like, that's, that's, um, that's what you do. And, um, um, and then, yeah. And Joseph Campbell also is that there's this famous show interview joseph campbell about myths and legends and um did with bill moyers i guess in the 80s and mm -hmm. um bill bill moyers asked um so what would advice would you have for for young people today and he was just and he said follow your bliss <laughs> do what makes you happy and what 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 makes you that's the that's like the hard path that's like you know you're doing the right thing if it's if it's, oh, it's um, true it's true actually yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, but yeah, you, you mentioned sex mob, and um, I did this talk with Steven, and he said you guys are actually is going to be a tour coming up, if I'm not mistaken, also. And but uh, well, I, I wanted to go back a little I bit. Mean, we had the tour; it must have been. Uh, oh, you had the tour then, yeah. Yeah, it was a few, few weeks ago. Oh yeah, that was it. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, yeah. How did you guys? I, I I know you mentioned Steven came to Seattle and you saw him there, but like. How did your your hookup? It's one of the longest working bands, probably, if that still exists in jazz. But like, <laughs> probably. Yeah, not. yeah, we've been together a long time. Um, I was roommates with Aaron Alexander, who's a, a fantastic drummer and composer yeah. from Seattle. He's part of that part of a um, part of that world. Um, been in New York longer than I have, um, but I we just in Seattle we lived together, and Aaron was subbing for one of the drummers in the flying karamazov brothers band mm -hmm. they were in in town doing a show and um and aaron was like hey a couple of guys from the show um and i are uh, we're gonna go play at this club do you want to come play with us with artist the spoon man and uh some people from the, the and I was like, okay. So I went and that's where I met Steven. And um, the the joke is, is that I got my job in the band because I had nice shoes. Um, <laughs> Steven is a, is a fashion maven. And in, in those days I had a pair of, a uh, pair of Doc Martens, which I always kept, you know, super polished and, you know, they're really, although they were really worn broken in, they were just like super polished. And he was like, ah, like those shoes, man, you get to New York, call me, look me up. <laughs> so, uh, so, and, and I did. So, and then he started Sex Mob, um, kind of like me with the guitar, probably. He didn't know it was going to last as long as it did. I think he put the band together, if I get the story, if I understand, right? It's kind of like as a, as a delivery system for him, um, learning how to play the slide trumpet. Right. Oh, okay. Um, he created this situation for himself, too to work out um slide trumpet and um and that certainly changed my life um i 
my own music, I, I, I tend to think like kind of angularly and, and, and shapes and textures and stuff, but I still, I, I, I love playing melodies and I, the, my favorite thing in the world is to play melodies with Stephen and mm -hmm. with the slide trumpet, the way that that, that instrument can zero in on, on pitches and, um, just learning also to just like with Wayne, like I never wanted to quit sex mob, but it was, it was a challenge to, to figure out how to, how to play with, with, with Steven playing that instrument. Um, and it really, that really changed my playing as well, because it's, um, to not be locked into, mm -hmm. um, D E F sharp G, you know, it's like just, yeah. you know, you have to, you have to kind of let the clutch out a little bit. And, um, and that, yeah, that was just, that was just amazing. And it's, uh, it's my favorite thing. It's my favorite thing. Is that where you started touring like really extensively Europe? I mean, I, I know you went with Bobkas and Wayne probably, right? Before or sure that my first after, right? tours were with, with Pigpen. Oh, okay. Pigpen was the first, uh, I think we did three or four uh, tours. Um, I know our first tour was before I even, before I'd moved to New York. Um, and, um, yeah, so that was, that was my first tours with pig pen and then Bacchus and, um, and eventually sex mob. And, and there were some like knitting factory kind of package tours, um, with another group called myth science, mm -hmm. um, that I was in, it's like a sun Ra cover band. Um, and, um, yeah, sex mob done, did, 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 did a lot of, done a lot of touring. We'll do more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how did, how did after playing 400 gigs together or whatever, probably more, or it's hard to say, but, uh, you know, to keep yourself inspired and still surprised, how does that work in a working band for 25 years or 20 years or how do you guys I'm, do I'm... that? I'm playing with Steven Bernstein and Tony <laughs> Sharon, Kenny Wallace, and that's how you do it. That's the answer. Yeah, I think you, you answered. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's just it's just always fun. And um, as Tony once said, it's it's my Beatles of of Sex Mob. It's like it's my Beatles. It's like it's the band I've you know it's my life band. I think, mm. and it's just we you know I've. We've played some tunes like since the beginning, like Sign of the Times, and it's always different, and it's it's fine, and it's we just have a blast, and the 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 traveling together is always really fun, and um, yeah, it's just it's just a joy. I I I'm, I'm very very lucky to to be um, to have been part of part yeah. of that part of that part of that band, you know. Yeah, I, I, I saw him live so many times. It's so much fun to see you guys on stage. Also, that's oh, I, I have a blast. Yeah. I have a blast. Um, yeah, I, I really, I really do. I, I just I'll, my my only job is is that I I have to I have to stand kind of in a way that I can constantly watch Stephen. Yeah, um, sure. Because he's we never have a set list. And, um, so he'll just, he'll just call out what the next tune is, or he'll do this little, little, some sort of hand gesture. We all know does like, Oh, do this, you know, or like, you know, it's just kind of like, that's another, like, you know, amazing thing about Steven that, um, you know, besides his, his playing and his, his composing and writing, the, the new record is all his music and it's really, really oh. fantastic. I can't wait for that to come out. Oh, um, in collaboration with Scott Harding, Scotty Hard, um, who kind of did a lot of editing and, and his own kind of like mixed magic to the, mm -hmm. to the, to the record. But, um, on top of all that, and this is really amazing that like in the midst of the, the fray of like the moment of whatever the music is, Steven's able to kind of like look from, you know, look from, mm. you know, kind of above the stage and go like, Hmm, what, what piece should we do next? Like, where should we go now? Um, or what do I want to have happen? You know, kind of like he's almost two people in one. He's like the, the live conductor and he's doing, you know, playing his instrument. It's really, it's, it's really, um, it's really remarkable. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm amazed about that. I love that. Yeah. Uh, 
And you mentioned before also Frizzell was on a pollinator gig. <laughs> like, you, you know, you played with Frizzell on Unspeakable. And uh, yeah. how yeah. did that happen? I mean, I, I guess, of course, you not knew each other from Seattle from before, but can you just describe your... I mean, he's my biggest hero as a guitar player, like, or one of my favorite top three musicians. So how was your yeah. experience with him? I mean... Um... I've played with him before uh, a couple of times, like even when I was in Seattle, I think um, we played together at the OK Hotel on, on something like maybe I sat in with his band or something. But um, and a couple of times I'd go over to his house and we'd, we'd hang out and play duets and stuff. But um, but the unspeakable record was produced by Hal Wilner yeah. and Hal, um, I guess I I don't know exactly but i assume it was it was hal had the idea that he wanted to have um horns on a couple of tunes so um so he got steven and curtis folks and i yeah um, beautiful lineup yeah and um yeah it was um so and we just went it was like an overdub overdub session i have a photo from that session it's really nice with hal and everybody oh, really? and, yeah yeah did you play them gigs with that band also or no or no? no well no 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 i don't know if he play if he ever toured with music from that but um but i, I was never on on any of them hmm. okay but now, now you're doing like a guitar duo probably i think he saw you so <laughs> <laughs> brigham it's well, I, it's bill here <laughs> yeah no, i better i'll, I'll keep I'll keep my guitar up, tuned right? and ready to run out the door <laughs> in any moment. Yeah. Yeah. No, but uh, Brigham, I also wanted to ask you, you know, what, what's coming up for you in the upcoming weeks and months, like touring wise or project wise? Like you said, you don't this band leading kind of or whatever, you know, music wise. So what are the plans for you? Um, I'm you caught me at a at a weird time, um, in that I'm kind of. Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I did some recording with, um, Tony Cher and, um, uh, Luke, Lucas Koenig, um, really? oh, he's wow. a great drummer from yeah, I know. Austria. From Austria. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Um, played a bunch with Lucas. Um, really? and, um, so we did, we did some recording and, um, I'd kind of like to try to mix that. Um, but, um, I was kind of doing a, an, another kind of duo recording, kind of a thing with Kenny, um, that we're kind of working on kind of ongoing, but, um, oh, well, awesome. but as far as anything, like any, any, even gigs, I don't really, I really don't know. Um, yeah. yeah pro probably after the new sex mob record, a tour will come so next year. Hopefully. Um, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, there's some stuff nice. maybe with 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 Sex Mob in the spring already, yeah. and um, but as as far as my um, um, my own Projects, thing, yeah. I'm, I'm just kind of um, I'm a kind of I don't know. I'm kind of in a place where I, I'm kind of just Perfect. collecting, trying to collect my collect my wits, kind of. So um, yeah. it'll come, but I'm just kind of. You know, I don't really know what I want to do, what I really want to do next. So we'll That's see. Good. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. cool. looking forward to whatever comes up. And, um, oh, man. you know, so, and hopefully to see you again in Mario or in Europe. So to drink yeah. a beer, beer yeah. together and enjoy the music. So yeah. cool. Love to do that. Love to. Bring it, man. Thanks so much for for sharing some of these thoughts and taking the time. So I'm really happy. So. Hey, well, thank you for for asking me to um, to have a chat, and I uh, really appreciate yeah. it. So. Mm -hmm.